welcome to another episode of The Buzz Around Bees. So this year, in our first episode, we actually showed you how to introduce the honeybee into the hive. In subsequent episodes, we inspected the hives, we inspected um, looking for a number of different things, we looked for the queen, we found the queen. In one episode, we actually found the queen and marked a queen. Um, right up until the last episode, in which we extracted the honey and then showed you how to bottle it. So for the whole year, um, we went from the installation of the bees to the extraction of the honey. This is going to be our last episode of this season, but I'm pleased to announce, and we'll talk about it at the end, that we're coming back for another episode for our second year. So during the course of the year, I've had people, mentors, friends, um, that have come on the show to help me because as I've said in other episodes, I've had people on the show that have forgotten more about bees than I'll ever know. And today, I'm really, really pleased to have with us a kind of a roundtable discussion. Um, two people, uh, one that you've seen in some other episodes, Mr. Glenn Cornell, who is also the uh, instructor of the Bee School at the Plymouth County Beekeepers Association, as well as Ann Rain, the president of the Plymouth County Beekeepers Association. And we're really pleased to have them with us today. Um, this discussion that we're about to have could probably go on for hours, um, but we only have 30 minutes, so we're going to try to um, make it a concise conversation about the honeybee. Um, I got into it some years ago, uh, probably about four years ago, after thinking about it for many years, and I finally decided I'm going to do it. So I had a friend that helped me, and I started with two hives. And before I got the hives or the bees, I read two books. I watched a two-hour and 20-minute DVD, and I still had no idea what I was doing. Um, it's very complicated. The honeybee is a fascinating insect, animal. It's the life of the honeybee, what they do. It's just fascinating. So I'd like to start with Anne and just tell us the importance of the honeybee in our society. Well, and welcome, by the way. Thank you. Um, well, the honeybee pollinates almost 60% of our food. If we didn't have it, the bees, we wouldn't have a lot of what you see in the supermarkets all over. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm joking. <laughs> the, uh, well, no, you know, it's funny you say 60% because we were talking before that I saw, um, I saw something online or somewhere that they did an experiment in San Francisco, and I think you said that they did it locally as well, maybe Rhode Island, where they took all of the food out of a whole food store that was pollinated by a bee and it was like almost 60% of the food in the store. Isn't, isn't that what you would? Yeah, so uh, a Whole Foods in Rhode Island in 2014 pulled everything off the produce department shelves that would have been pollinated by a honeybee and wanted to show people had they not been there, this is what you would end up with. And about two thirds of the produce was missing. So if you can imagine going through a produce department and not finding oranges, uh, apples, uh, or uh, any of that, cherries, it goes on and on and on. It, it, it's, it's amazing. I think people would be shocked. They don't realize we take too much for granted in going into these food stores and just picking what we want. I think that's part of it is people do take things for granted. They have no idea. And frankly, I didn't know until I became a beekeeper and started researching and looking into this stuff just really how important they are in our society. There is, you hear a lot about bees dying and colony collapse disorders and bees, not just honeybees, but bees in general just disappearing. Can you talk about that for a minute and, and tell us about that whole phenomenon? So from um, my standpoint of view, um, one of the things that I try and teach in the school that this, this is where it's really getting difficult. The bees of today are not the bees of yesterday. We're spending more and more time on them, and the end result is getting worse and worse. Uh, but you can't give up. Um, there's, there's a round-robin discussion on exactly what's doing it, but there's a lot of things that are, are involved here. It's not one item. This is built up over time, and um, it's not one particular item, from plants to food to just the air quality to everything. And maybe, maybe Ann can address some of this. Well, I have pretty strong opinions on what's killing our honeybees, and it's also killing all of our pollinators, actually, and it's, in, it's our industrial food system, I think. I think it's the culmination of the chemicals building up in the environment. One of the things that people don't realize is honeycomb in a hive is like a sponge. 
and they're going out and they're gathering and gathering and gathering. They gather from everywhere. People say organic honey, organic beekeeping. You can't do it because where we live, we're surrounded. We've got Joe six pack down the street with his beautifully manicured lawn that's sprayed with pesticides. The bees go to that lawn. The bees go everywhere. And they bring stuff back into the hive and it builds up in the hive. And eventually, I think it reaches, it's reaching critical mass now. I don't believe there's any um, clean wax. They can't, they test it. There's no clean wax left in the country. There is none. So it's, it's just, it's, they are absorbing everything and they're reaching critical mass and they're dying. Is it one thing's fault? No, no. And then we have the problem of the varroa mite that was introduced back in the 80s. Which is what I wanted to talk yeah. about. I've heard Glenn talk about it a number of times the, at school. Exactly, well the varroa mite is, is like, it's like a fist sized pest on the bee. And it's, there's discussion now over what it's actually eating. It's eating the hemoglyph and the fat they're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we're, we as beekeepers, we're trying to manage the mite. We're managing a mite on an insect, and we're trying to use the softest methods that we possibly can, but we're also using things that are causing uproars in the hives. So really the poor honeybee, I, I, the one thing, it's not the honeybee that's changed. It's no. the whole environment no. around the honeybee that has changed. That's what's killing the honeybee. I, you know, as, as a beekeeper, and I've only been doing it for a few years, I, I really do find it fascinating. I mean, the life of a bee and how far they travel uh, in the course of a day to forage for food. And, you know, the, it takes 21 days for them to be born. And then, you know, some of them only live 45 days. But during their lifetime, they have different jobs that they have to do. Um, it's, I find it, it's fascinating, but again, someone that gets into it as a hobby really needs to have a support system like the Plymouth County Beekeepers Association because without them, your history, I mean, if I didn't have friends and if I didn't have, you know, people that I know from the Plymouth County Beekeepers, I never would have, right. I, I never would have gotten anywhere. So the Plymouth County Beekeepers Association, which is an amazing group of people that meet, you know, often, and it's very knowledgeable people that give really good hints and tips and guidance to people like me. Um, and during the course of this season, I mean, and, and, and I, again, this is the third year in a row I've taken the, the school. No, um, <laughs> but you know what? Uh, knowledge is power. I mean, you can't not know what you're doing. And whatever little bit of information that you can pick up is helpful. That's why, you know, I, I feel like I'm going back. I'm, I'm, I'm staying back again. It's the third time. I find it fascinating. But, I, you know, and I, I love listening to the to Glenn and the different speakers, and it's important to have that mentor. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to have a couple of them, and Glenn being one who appeared on a couple of um, episodes of the show. So people that are interested in, in beekeeping, um, before they just jump into it, say, oh, it looks fun, I'm gonna buy a hive, um, really should, should give us some research, but I'm gonna tell you something. It is the most rewarding hobby that I think one, one could do. Um, tell us about your hives, Glenn. How many, you've had, at one time, how many hives? Uh, I'm running about a dozen hives. Um, and then I, I run another, uh, I use uh, a lot of nukes, which I don't want to, they're basically a, a small hive, if you can think of it. It's not a full hive that I would expect to get honey out of because I'm re I really want to do this for the bees. And the honey aspect of it is just probably trying to recoup the money that I'm spending in trying to save the bees. Which is virtually impossible, by the way, but oh. so <laughs> if you're getting into it for the money, forget it. Forget so it. getting back to the mentor, this is why we push it so much, because even with a mentor and even with uh, an experienced beekeeper, we're somewhere up in the 60 to 70 percentile rate of losing bees. I mean, and, and to talk about the mites, I think as an experienced beekeeper, we can control the mite to some degree as long as we have the tools to do it. But there's so many other things, like Ann was saying, that we don't have control of. People spraying their lawns, people putting things on their flowers. So maybe one out of five things can we make an attempt at controlling, and those other four things are out of our hand, but to educate people and please help us to stop what's going on in society. And to to expound on that, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I have a bee-friendly yard. 
I do everything I can in my yard with water supplies and right. bee friendly plants and flowers. But unfortunately, when they leave my yard and they go, it's out of your control. It's out of my control. And the Good. other thing that's out of your control is a lot of people buy plants, particularly from big box stores, and they don't know it, but they're treated with the neonicotinoids that are persistent in that soil, and they persist in the plants afterwards. So um, it's their cheap plants. Everybody, you know, is into cheap and inexpensive. But in the long run, none of this is cheap. It's very expensive because somehow we have to get past it. And it's, it's our health, and it's the bees' health. It's everybody's health that's being affected. Uh, Home Depot, I believe Lowe's has taken a vow to get rid of the neonics. I think a lot of the stores are now starting to pay attention because we're out yelling, please don't buy. So they're starting to come around and not using those neonics. But neonics have been pushed since 2006. They're everywhere throughout our, our food system and the retail system for florist flowers. And I, you know, people have to realize that and say, I don't want it. Don't, I don't want to buy it. I don't want to buy it anymore. And that, that's the best way we have to vote with our wallets, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And how many hives do you have? Um, I, think we have I think we have 17 right now. We have three different apiaries. And it's fun. All, all local. All, but yeah. not all in your backyard. You have oh, no, different no, no, places. No. no, we have them in Rockland and down, down in Plimpton. And is that, that's the association that, that has that? The so, that's you personally? No, that's us. And now, I know the association has, they do the queen rearing, correct? Correct. That's Glenn. And, and where do they do that at? So we have two locations. Uh, we use our starter colonies are at my house. And then our finishing product where the queens are actually evolved after they're started is um, over in West, uh, East Bridgewater. Um, and, and then from there they go to our members first. Okay. Um, but it's, a, it's a, a very short season around here. We can only make so many of these queens. Actually, the bees are making them. We're trying to trick them into making them. Yeah, trick them into making more. Talking about making more. So in the spring, end of April, early May, we'll pick up our bee packages, which is something I want to talk about okay. for the beginning of, of our next season's show. So, and if someone watched, if anybody watched our uh, first episode this year, the packages come in a box about this big with screen on both sides, and there's around six to 7,000 bees in that. No, there's actually ten. more than that, closer to 10. Ten, really? Yeah. 10,000. Oh, I thought it was Three pounds of bees. Three, three pounds of bees. That I knew, but I thought it was around 7,000 yeah. bees. Okay, which me makes it even crazier when we talk about it in a few minutes. So those 10,000 bees that you pick up at the end of April become how many in June and July? That's what I think is also one of those things that's like crazy. 60 to 80,000. So we buy these boxes, these packages. We in put them in our hive. We nurture them. We feed them in the spring. And... We wish them well, and in a few months they become sixty to 80,000 bees, which for people watching or listening, they're sitting there going, that's nuts. And it, it really is amazing. And you have to keep adding, you know, as a real estate developer, I, you know, I call it. You're talking about, hey, I'm, I'm adding condos, you know. I'm adding <laughs> apartments, apartments to the hives. Right. You know, we start with two deeps and then uh, two supers, and then you put on some deeps, and, mm -hmm. and you keep adding, and, and, you know, you like to see, them adding because that means you have more bees, more honey. Um, but it still, after I've been doing this for a few years, it's mind-boggling that we take those 10,000 bees and they become 60 to 80,000 bees. Well, she's very busy laying eggs, 1,500 to 2,000. Mm -hmm. I was, yeah. I was just, just going to ask laying. you, I was just going to ask you, explain that to us, the, the queen and the whole process with the drone and the laying of the eggs. You want us to explain the birds and the bees to you? I, you know what? <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't I want like to that. say that. But it might sound corny, but please <laughs> explain the birds and the bees to us. You I do think it. it's, You're again, it's, at the, it's, at the biology of the bee. So uh, it, it's like a truck rolling down the street. That's what I like to say is. It, now, I haven't heard you say that at a class, but. You haven't. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I guess I kind of use a, a car analogy a lot, but it's like a truck rolling down the street where. You need the gasoline, you need the tires, you need the maintenance before you're going to carry that big load. And that's what the bees do. So we start them out with 10,000 bees, and everybody has their own little job. And the queen lays so many eggs based on what the bees can clean for her mm. and maintain for her. They will never 
let her lay 20,000 eggs if they didn't have enough bees to maintain them for fear that they would die. That's their number one priority are those babies that are in there, the young. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a, uh, just that's why I say it's a truck rolling down the street. They, they clean what they know that they can maintain. The queen will find that. And she just lays and lays and lays. Yep. As fast as they can build in a new, in a new colony, they're building. Their first thing is to build. They have to build their home out because we put them on foundation. Unless you have fully furnished condos, which is what I call <laughs> drawn comb. And, uh, you know, they, they, they clean it out or they build it out, and she just follows them along. As fast as they can finish it, she's laying eggs as much as they can support. So what I also think it's important to tell is people may not realize that all of the worker bees are all female. Mm -hmm. The queen is obviously a female. All the worker bees are female. So if you have 50,000 worker bees that are all female, you have 1,000. Uh, what's the ratio, do you think? Of the drones. When, the, when, the drone, when, uh, when we're in full season, I wonder how many, what's the ratio of drones to workers? Uh, 7%, Seven percent. About 7% 7 male. And that's only to produce another queen or support another hive that needs another queen. Right. So the queen really mates, or however you want to call it, once. She flies. Well, she mates multiple times on one, one flight. One flight. One flight. With, there's a whole bunch of drones flying above, and mm -hmm. and then she comes back and she lays eggs for the next. And, mm -hmm. Her life. Fifteen hundred to two thousand a day, potentially. In the peak of the season. The peak of the, the, season, peak of the yeah. season. Correct. So she has a little pheromone that actually suppresses the other female workers because they do have eggs. Mm. but they don't have the sperm to add to it to produce another worker. They will only produce males. So she actually walks around the hive dropping her scent everywhere, letting them know, here I am, I'm, d I'm the one, and I'm the only one that's going to produce. And that's another trick of the little hive. I didn't get into it this year with you. <laughs> I, we ran out of time, but it's very important that that queen maintains health. And, and I, I'm a firm believer that that's another part that's going on. These queens aren't healthy. Yeah. They're just not healthy. That's why we see so much collapse in the colony, too. There was someone, and I don't remember who it was last year, said to me, you need to watch this show. And I don't, it was on demand on Netflix. It was something, it was a two-part series. It was a, a half hour each show called Hive Alive. And if you can find it, you need to watch it. These two guys in England wanted to investigate the life of a bee and do a documentary on a honeybee. So they took a hive and they had military grade radar no that they put on a bee, okay? They put microphones in the hive, they put cameras in the hive, they had heat sensors, they had a drone, not a bee drone, but a, an actual drone, mm -hmm. follow these bees around. It was a military grade radar to follow the bee and they were finding out how far the bee mm -hmm. flew. And when they came back to the hive, the waggle mm -hmm. to show the rest of the bees in the hive, or to tell the rest of the bees in the hive where to go during a honey flow. Um, and at the end, they actually, um, oh, they numbered the bees when they were born. Yeah. I mean, and people watching going, that's insane. But if they had seen the episode where you mocked a queen, oh, yeah. um, you mocked a queen on one of our shows. We found the queen. It was a new queen. You mocked her. I thought it was incredible when you did it. So it's not so nuts that they can number bees. And they did this. If you have the opportunity to watch it, it's worth it watching. And at the end, they wanted to show what a bee sting would do. So, and we all know that if a bee stings you and it pulls away, it will die. And then if you, if you don't take the stinger out properly, you're going to end up with a, a lot of... load. Yeah. <laughs> what they did was they got the bee... They put her on this guy's arm. I don't know if they agitated or what they did. <laughs> the bee stung the guy, but they used tweezers to pull the stinger out and leave it attached to the bee so they wouldn't kill the bee. No kidding. And then what they did was they had this um, um, sensors to show the heat that was developing in the guy's arm, and they showed it swelling From up a little infection. bit. It was, <clears throat> it was unbelievable, but, I mean, it's just the whole... <laughs> Like a bee comes back to the hive and it does a waggle, it does a dance, and it does a figure eight, and it, it lets the other bees know where to go. Gives them um, the direction, the angle, and the distance to the nectar source or whatever. 
what the, if they're if it's um they're swarming it'll it'll tell them where they found a cavity. I found hey come follow me follow me. It's called swarm consensus, and eventually the whole swarm will go with that bee. Tell us about I'm going to use the term robbing. I got robbed. I I believe that I got robbed this this year. Tell robbing us. Robbing was bad this year. Was it? Yeah. yeah. So I'm not the only guy that got robbed. Lack of food. Yeah. It so. was it, because we had that little drought. That last year was a drought. This year was just a little. We had a little dry spot, and they went nuts. Explain to us what it what that means. So most of the robbing occurs because the the bees once they don't have a food source, they only know how to work. That's that's all they do. They they're going to, going to go out there and they're going to work and work and work, and they want their food sources to bring it back for the health of their hive, and for their survival. And what happens when they run out of this food and they can't find any more, they go around and pick on other hives. So they, they know, they can tell by the smell of the hive because they have unique smelling senses that, hey, this hive over here is weak. Yeah. And we're just going to introduce ourselves in there. We know they don't have enough guards. We know there's not enough workers in here. And we're going to kind of sneak in. And when they're not looking and we pacify them, we're going to steal all their food. And then it gets to a point where the bees are overwhelmed. It, it went from 1,000 bees to 20,000 bees are now attacking this hive, and the bees that own that hive just have to stand back and watch. And it's empty in a matter of hours. I, I think that I did a couple of things wrong, which was one of the reasons I got robbed, but I didn't have an entrance reducer on when I probably should have. We I told away. you. I know. I did, did I tell you? <laughs> you did. We See, were, <laughs> I told you you want to get these down to the smallest. And I didn't. <laughs> and we went away. Yeah, oh. And when I left... We went away for a little over a week, and when I left, I had all oh, these bees and all this. Hours. I came home, it's and I, hours. I said to my wife, I don't think that there's any bees in that hive. And I went out, and I nosed around for a day or so, and I finally opened the hive. There were no bees. No. There was no honey. There was nothing. It's clean. I mean, and when I left, there was probably 50, 60, 70 pounds of honey in the hive. Sure. But sure. it didn't happen to one of my hives. It, was, it happened to two But it went hives. over to another hive. Yeah. The problem is that the, even the bees that survive... That's warming. If they can, they'll try and coax themselves into another hive. But it's the queen that's left high and dry. Yeah. There was Unfortunately. A, uh, you, you had mentioned swarming. There's a friend of mine that lives on Harvard Street in Whitman who had a couple of hives. He's a former, reti he's a retired school teacher in Whitman, had some hives. And he said one day that his bees absconded. They swarmed. And he said it looked like a, a, a dust bowl yeah. mm -hmm. going down the street. He said there was 50,000 bees flying in this big thing down the street through his, yep. his neighbor's backyards. He said he was horrified. So it's rewarding, it's fun, but it, it there's, very there's quickly... There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about no. it. It can my, very quickly... My bees swarm all the way. All, they go to Paul Camello's house. I know exactly where they're going because they go <laughs> that way. <laughs> okay, Paul's got more bees. <laughs> oh, that's funny. You know, and the same guy told me that one day he went out and he had all these bees that he hadn't had, and I said, I want them back. Yeah, I, give, you me know, my bees. He had my, give me my bees back. They left my house and, and went yep. to yours. Yep. Um, I think that we're probably getting close to to ending uh, within the next couple of minutes. So I want to talk about next year. Kevin Tachi, whose idea the show was in the first place, mm -hmm. um, from local cable, Whitman Cable, he also does radio, knew that I was a beekeeper and said this would be a great idea for a local show. So it was Kevin's idea that we do this. It wasn't my idea. Um, and I'm grateful to Kevin for allowing us to do this, but I'm grateful to all the people that, I've, that have helped me uh, do the show because I think it's been pretty interesting and they've talked about doing a second year a, a second series so my thought was not doing it in my backyard like we did this past year but going out on the road and uh, going to other people's road houses show. yeah do a road show but I thought that the first episode would be amazing if we started the day that the bees were delivered down in Plimpton. And we yeah. always do something yeah. down there. So yeah. <clears throat> my thought was this. Now, and we've made it even more dramatic because if I said six or 7,000 bees and there was 900 hives, uh, 900 packages, that's six and a half million bees. No, no, but it's it, way more than that. So if there's, <laughs> and, and people are going to find this hard to believe, but if you have 900 packages, which you will have, mm -hmm. and there's 10,000 bees in each one, right. that's nine million bees. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. Um, we, if you go down to the barn, if you're actually there, the, when we pull them off the truck, what's at 4 o'clock in the morning, we pull them off the truck and stack them in, in um, Rick's barn. 
you go down there later on in the morning and you can feel the heat because they're generating heat to keep themselves warm. It's amazing. And while they're in there, they've got that can of syrup in there. They're, 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 starting, to gen they're starting to make wax. There's wax flakes all over the floor because they want to get out mm -hmm. and make a really hot. It's started. amazing what they, they just want to go. They want to go. And it's fun to hand a box, a three pound box of bees mm -hmm. to a brand new beekeeper and they're like, Okay, and we're like, now you take it home and put it in a hive. <laughs> it's, it's a riot. I'm going to tell you, the first time that I was handed that box of bees, I'm like, oh, what the heck am I going to do no, now? Oh, no, what did I get myself it was into? Like, <laughs> I was horrified. And it was like, and I, I brought them home, and that was when the, the queen was in the little cage, the trembling cage, and it was attached yeah. um, with a staple. Yeah. Not have, never having done this before, I took the staples out of that and the the thing on top so when i lifted it off and i took the sugar water out the queen fell into the bees oh, oh boy there you go no you take the queen out first well i guess with the first one where, you? where were you when <laughs> i needed you so my wife was standing across from me i looked at her and i can't even repeat on tv what i said uh -huh. and i'm like now what am i going to do hand in i just stick my hand in <laughs> so here i am hyperventilating sweating and the queen fell into the thing with 10,000 bees and i had to reach in and get uh -huh. she goes oh i can see it i'm like oh good but you get it <laughs> so that was my very very first mm -hmm. um introduction into beekeeping yep. and I'm like well and my first year was very successful which was a few years ago so to go back to the barn so I thought that the first um, shooting that we would do would be to come down there and film in the barn because I think it would be incredible to yeah. see millions of bees in one place in these boxes and if I remember correctly that I could hear a little buzzing going on when I was just in there a it was a, just a little buzzing Pretty loud. and uh, I remember this past year it was a it was a cold misty day yeah, that buzzing. we picked him up um, but when I was asked to do the second year, I said, this is perfect. And I think that we might even want to do more stuff, you know, if it's acceptable to the association mm -hmm. with the cool. actual Plymouth County Beekeepers Association to, to have that awareness out there of, sure. of the bees and what you people do with the, with the club. And um, I just think it's, it's, I have had more people. I've been on cable for many years doing a guest on many shows. I've never had so many people say something to me about this show and how intrigued they are with it, because it's different. Mm. It you is know, intriguing. We did a show, the second show that we did, and I didn't have any gloves on. And I had people coming into my restaurant saying, they were watching it, they'd already seen it going, are you crazy you had no gloves on? And it, well, it's easy to work with, but you know. I talked you into removing them, you, didn't you, I? You taught me a few things. This but, was a really great but year. But never without a veil. Never no. without a no, veil. No, never without a veil. Never without a veil. No. Yeah, I don't want to be that guy that gets stung in the... In the and we do throat. do three demonstrations. Yeah. Uh, the day of the back uh, package pickup for new bee students, or for anybody that would like to see an actual... I think that, that we're going to do that. We have, we only have less than a minute left, and I just really want to take the opportunity to thank Kevin for coming up with the idea of the show. I want to thank you, Glenn, for being a guest on some of the... Thank you for inviting me. Thank I'm you. honored to have you as the president <clears throat> of the association here. Um, so we'll do it again next year. Uh, we'll be back at the end of April when the bees arrive. And for all of those that have watched during the course of the year, I want to thank you very much. And we'll be back next year, and we'll try to make it interesting for you, and we'll, uh, we'll tell you what the bees are all about. Thank you.